which brings us on to detecting the ventilatory threshold. So in other words, the protocol that we're going to use is exactly the same protocol as we would use if we were running a conventional incremental test to exhaustion. Probably want to use anywhere between one to three minute stages. Conventionally we tend to use longer stages because again we're looking for a steady state at each workload. So if we were doing three minute stages with the lactate data, it would make sense to do three minute stages with, with the ventilatory data. If you do one minute stages, remember that you're trying to find a balance between VCO2 and VE submaximally. If you do one minute stages, we may not have got to steady state. So there is certainly good argument for doing three to four minute stages. Well, there's a report that came out in 1985 in MedSci Support and Exercise by Davis which suggested there may be a problem in all of this, which is it is not always obvious to be able to see, as I've mentioned before, the actual VE versus VCO2 response. You don't see the disproportionate um, shift in CO2 against minute ventilation. So what they suggested was, can you look for a parameter um, against a, a parameter that holds still versus an, uh, sorry, a non-moving parameter against a moving parameter. And that, that makes a lot of sense. In other words, if you know there is one parameter that always is pretty much level throughout the course of the test, and another parameter that follows it but then breaks away, then presumably, if you can identify that point, then that, that's a, a pretty good indication of what's going on. And this is starting to really tease something out, which is identifying the ventilation threshold isn't that easy, particularly if you just decide that you're going to use one approach. And we're going to look at them um, in a moment in a, in a review paper, um, sorry, a publication in MedSci Sport and Exercise by, um, by Gaskell, which proposed that you don't just use one approach here. Use a multitude of approaches to identify this point, because you're using ventilatory data, which is, for all intents and purposes, can be quite imprecise. Remember that it's dependent upon breathing frequency, it's dependent upon the way somebody breathes, it's dependent upon whether they have coughed, sighed, belched, or whatever. It can affect all the data sets. But Davis suggests this idea, um, a breakpoint against a non-moving parameter. And the variables that they recommended, again, you can see the two key variables here, VE and um, VO2 and VCO2. And in fact, the key component here is that they, they want to identify the um, what are called the ventilatory equivalents. The ventilatory equivalents are where you take the VE and you divide it by the VO2 and the VE and divide it by the VCO2. So in other words, it's the, 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 the proportion of that VE, the proportion of the VE that is used in terms of oxygen consumption and the proportion of the VE that is used in terms of um, CO2 um, release. And what you do is you plot these against exercise intensity and what you should see is a disproportionate change in the one parameter against the other and therefore provide you with a means of identifying the ventilatory threshold. So what you should find is this that there will be a point where you get a systemic rise initially in VEVO2 without any change in VEVCO2. Now that doesn't mean VEVCO2 won't change. But what they found was that, remember, the primary thing is that VCO2 drives ventilation and drives the ventilatory mechanisms. So if we start to produce CO2 at the muscle, the CO2 at the muscle going, driving up will actually in itself trigger an increase in QO2 at the muscle, oxygen demand. If oxygen demand goes up at the muscle, the feedback mechanism is that there will be an increase in minute ventilation. The minute ventilation increases to, to increase the amount of air that can be extracted because we now have to increase the VO2 to meet the QO2 as a consequence of the CO2 rising. So what we see is actually we see VE, VO2, rises before VE, VCO2. They remain fairly coupled. It's just that the CO2 has triggered the first stage response in terms of there has to be more oxygen meeting demand. Then the VE, VCO2 will follow that pattern. But you'll see that VE, VO2 and VE, VCO2 will follow this pattern. This is VE, VCO2 at the bottom. This is VE, VO2 at the top. 
VEVO2 does that, and then later VEVCO2 does that. So it's where you get that first initial break point. And we can see it here on this schematic. This is um, from Carl Wasserman, who was one of the world leading authorities. It was Wasserman who really pushed the idea of using ventilatory threshold, particularly in clinical population uh, groups. And if you look towards the middle, can you see the VEVCO2 and the VEVO2? And what you can see quite clearly is that the VEVCO2, for the majority of the exercise challenge, you see work rate on the x-axis at the bottom remains linear. But you start to see that the VEVCO2 breaks before the VE, sorry, the VEVO2 breaks before the VEVCO2, just slightly. And again, let's go back for why that is the case. Remember that the driving mechanism for ventilatory control is CO2. So the CO2 that's produced at the muscle has to be cleared. If the CO2 being produced at the muscle, that will trigger an increase in minute ventilation, but it will also trigger an increase in oxygen demand at the muscle as well, so QO2. The net result is that the VE goes up, but we have to now extract more oxygen at the muscle to meet that increased QO2 demand, which was triggered by the rising CO2. So the net result is VEVO2 goes up. You get a disproportionate increase um, in the um, VO2 against the VE, and then, not long afterwards, you get this disproportionate increase in CO2 against the VE. However, the min that, that idea of using ventilatory equivalent as a surrogate indication of the ventilatory threshold seems quite potent. But even looking at that graph there, it doesn't look that clear, right? It doesn't look that obvious. So we are posing some, some there are some problems here that we, we perhaps need to, to think about. Ideally, we want to look for VE versus VCO2, but we don't always see it. VEVCO2 and VEVO2 don't look obvious, but they're there. We could plot VO2 versus VCO2. All of these are showing the same thing. And this really does make us start to think about perhaps we have to combine the methods to identify the same point. And again, just a data set, just to reinforce this, you can see quite clearly that if you just look at the VEVCO2, which is the third graph from the top on its own, it doesn't look like it's doing much. Whereas the VEVCO, VEVO2 does show that drift away. And ideally, you'd love it if it tied closely to the, to the lactate turn point. So here is this review paper by, by Gaskill, where they, they, they suggest, well, look, combine. You can, you can make this a more reliable approach. Because clearly, on their own, the methods don't always show what you want, and they don't always necessarily have agreement between each other. So combine methods. So in this, actually combine two methods that we've thought about, which is the V-slope, which is the VO2 versus the VCO2, and the ventilatory equivalent, which is the VEVO2 versus the VVCO2, with what's called the excess CO2 method. But you could use, for example, VE versus um, VCO2 as, as an alternate method. And their approach is you run all the different methods and you look for agreement in terms of where the breakpoint occurs. So in summary, each of the individual methods commonly used for determining ventilatory thresholds has limitations resulting in occasional false determinations. The use of the combined method described here can substantially decrease the number of indeterminate tests, reduce the error rate, and decrease the standard deviation of the difference between lactate turn point and ventilatory threshold. That is fundamental. One of the issues that we see in a lot of the literature is that, that, that a lot of groups are reporting that, that the VT and the lactate turn point don't tie. But the argument that Gaskill really has put forward is, well, it may be because there are errors in the way you've identified ventilatory threshold. Combine the methods, you reduce the error, you're more likely to get agreement. The combined method used in this study provides a reliable and valid process for the determination of ventilatory threshold in healthy individuals over a wide range of fitness levels. So the message seems to be a bit clearer than, than, than the lactate data. The lactate data doesn't give us enough information. The ventilatory threshold on its own, if you take one method, is perhaps not robust enough. But combine the methods and look for an agreement, you seem to be able to identify quite neatly the ventilatory threshold.